Welcome to the Homemaking Missionary on Radio Anjalia. I pray that you are all doing well, healthy and safe at home. This is quite a difficult time that we are going through. The children aren't in school. Work might be canceled. Here in Albania, we have a curfew, and almost everything is closed. And everyone has been touched in one way or another by this pandemic from the coronavirus. I recently read an email that said, As Christians, we are not just individuals who look out for ourselves. We are people who are called to love our God with heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have to remember as Orthodox Christians that we need to always focus on Christ. I recently reread an old episode of The Homemaking Missionary from over two years ago. I wanted to share it with you again because as we find ourselves at home with our children, it can be quite overwhelming and full of anxiety. But we as parents have to make the home, especially at this time of panic during the virus, a place of prayer, love, and hope. As I was telling my husband just the other day, this is the lentiest Lent we have ever experienced. There is hardly any distraction from eating non-Lenten foods going out to eat, participating in activities that take away from God, and we find ourselves unable to go to church. Therefore, our home has become our church. But honestly, my patience has been tested this last week and a half. I've lost my temper, I've cried, I've sat on the balcony just wishing that I could be anywhere but stuck inside. And I've thought about changing my name. Really? Who knew that your child could say mom over 100 times a day? But really, this last week and a half has also taught me again how important it is to my sons that I am a Christian witness for them in building our family on the fact that Christ is at the center. It's my duty to fight against this difficult time and to make this one of enjoyment fun and learning more about the church. I hope you enjoy listening to this special episode on Orthodox Parenting. St. John Chrysostom explains that the souls of children are like wax. If the right teachings are imprinted upon them from the beginning, these imprints harden, just as wax that is poured into the mold of a candle that hardens into the shape. Christ should be the mold for our children's souls, and we are responsible for making sure it sets according to His image. If they are molded in the way of loving and living a life in Christ, none of this will be able to be undone. St. John Chrysostom continues, that the soul of a child is like a newly found city, and the parents are the rulers. It is the parents' task to put in place laws and to organize a government of the newly founded city, the child's soul, so that it is not destroyed by malicious groups. Many groups, both good and bad, struggle to take over, securing their hold over the child's soul. The task of the parent is that of putting laws in place for this new city. As the child gets older, this task of putting boundaries and forming their spiritual world becomes difficult. St. John Chrysostom says that in the spiritual government of the child's soul, the walls are the body and the gates are the five senses. Everything enters from the outside world through these five senses. So how do we ensure that the walls are guarded so that the soul remains strong and centered on Christ? That is what I would like to talk with you about today. It is an enormous task to keep my family, and especially my sons, focused on Christ. But I wanted to share with you things we say, do, and implement in our house to focus our home, our family, and our sons on Christ and the Church. I have recently read a book by Dr. Philip Mamalakis called Parenting Towards the Kingdom. It is focused on raising children from an Orthodox mindset. At the beginning of his book, he mentions a basic Orthodox belief. Each one of us is created in the image and likeness of God. We are essentially icons of Christ. As icons of Christ, we are called to venerate each other, and that veneration is ultimately directed towards Christ. I remember an activity that I saw with teenage children. They all had a photo of someone they did not like. Then they were told to throw and destroy this picture of the person they did not like. They were told to say mean things and to treat the photo badly. In the end, the priest took off the photo that they were destroying and showed them underneath. The photo, there was an icon of Christ. 
We are all icons of Christ, and we are made in His image and likeness. Every day I try and instill the fact that my family and I need to understand that each one of us, and essentially everyone in the world, is made in the image and likeness of Christ, and we are all icons of Christ. By venerating each member of the family as a living icon, we are respecting them and setting clear boundaries and walls that help the soul stay focused on Christ. Dr. Mamalakis goes on to say, Learning how to parent is not about learning how to control your children's misbehaviors, but about learning how to respond effectively and consistently to whatever misbehavior they present. Just like in church and when we pray and participate in the liturgy, we are an example for our children. They will mimic us and repeat everything that we do. They see us and they hear us. The way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. If you tell your child they are strong and are a good person, they will believe that. If you tell them that they are stupid and worthless, they will also believe this. Words can be very strong in the minds of our children, which is why we have to be careful how we use them. There are different strategies that I use in my house. I try and make sure that all five senses are engaged in a good way, and I also try to be a good example what I want my sons to be like. Respectful words and trying really hard not to raise my voice. I try and listen to my sons with open ears as I always tell them. I try and make sure that they see beautiful things in the house, like flowers, icons, and photos of our family. And I try and make sure that there are nice smells, like incense and candles. Now I would like to share with you five things that you can say to your children in response to behaviors that are either wanted or unwanted. Number one, instead of just saying you're such a good boy, you can say, I saw that you shared your book with Ioani in church yesterday. That is to say, you can praise a certain part of your child's hard work rather than just the results. This helps to instill a growth mindset where they believe that they can still improve through their own efforts. Number two. My son and my husband are always losing things around the house. A book, a favorite toy, a shoe, you name it. Chances are that it gets misplaced. They're always asking me where things are. Even though it might take more work, I try to instill independence in my son. And yes, even in my husband. Hey honey, have you tried moving something in the fridge to see where that jam might be? I try and ask Moses. Where could you look for that? Where were you when you had it last? And if I really know where it is, I like to say, Have you checked by your bed? By responding to my son and helping him do this himself, he begins to learn self-sufficiency and independence. These emotions will instill confidence, which is an important character trait. Number three. This piece of advice is related with the previous. My son is at the age where he likes to have parents help. Sometimes, it is to get out of a job he doesn't want to do, like cleaning up his toys. But other times it is because the job is too big or overwhelming. I could do all of the work for him, but by doing that, I unintentionally send him the message that he is not capable of doing a certain task. I don't want to leave my son feeling overwhelmed or afraid, but I also don't want to do everything for him. By responding to him instead of reacting to him, I can figure out why he doesn't want to do a job. If he simply doesn't want to do a job, he needs to be helped to understand the importance of having order and discipline. If I realize he's overwhelmed, Mommy, there are so many toys out, I can't put them all away. Then I like to ask him, which part would you like my help with? And especially for cleanup time with his toys, I try and help him understand that we can work together. I'll put away the blocks if you put away the cars. If I realize he's afraid of something, I gently try and help him work through his fears so that he can overcome them. Number four. It's very easy to be short and to the point with demands. Sit down. Eat. Don't stand on the chair. The demands can be endless in the house with a five-year-old and a four-month-old. But instead, I notice that when I phrase the statement like a reminder, my son cooperates more freely. I also want to fill his mind and soul with positive statements not negative ones. At home, we roll the ball on the floor. We don't throw it at the picture frames on the walls. It's a very good to be positive about the behaviors you want from your child. If you say, stop running, 
Chances are that your child will only hear the word running and will continue to do just that. Instead, you could say, Remember, we walk in our house. And I almost guarantee that it will be easier for your children to listen. We also try and foster a vocabulary of nice words. For example, we try and use nice words when we are responding to him. Be patient, as opposed to stop doing that now. Use nice words instead of don't talk like that. Number five. One of the most common words I say to my son, most of the time with a loud voice, is be careful. In these last few months, it feels as if these words go right through one of his ears and out the other without him even hearing. Instead of just saying be careful, I try and help foster awareness now of the situation that he is in. For example, notice how when you bend that toy, you can see the plastic is not so strong? It might break if you keep doing that. Or, do you see the food that's spilling on the floor? Do you think it would be hard to clean up? Try using your hands to help you get off that bunch. That way you won't fall. Are you feeling scared because the lights turned off and you weren't ready? My husband is the first one to tell me that I try and fix every problem. I'm guilty of this. Fixing my son's problems makes me feel like I'm being a good mother, but it's not healthy for them. They need to know how to solve problems for themselves, and I have to constantly remind myself to help them grow in this skill. Here are some things I do to help my son's problem solve. For example, How will you get down off that slide if you don't want to go down? Or, What is your plan if you don't want to clean up your toys? And finally, What can you use to help you collect your toy blocks? As a parent, we have the choice to respond or react to our children. What is the difference between responding and reacting? Let me share an example with you. Moses loves our icon corner. He likes to kiss the icons, say prayers, have holy water and holy oil. But one day, I was in the kitchen washing dishes, just a little bit away from him, and I heard a crash and a sound of liquid falling. I looked around the corner, and sure enough, in the process of kissing his favorite icon, he knocked it off the wall into the condili and knocked it over, and there was oil dripping off of the table onto the floor. My first thought was, oh my goodness, what a mess. But if I reacted to this problem, I could have yelled, how many times have I told you not to touch the kandili? You never listen. Look at this mess that you made. You are so irresponsible. But I did not react. I responded with patience and in a self-controlled manner. I said, Moses, what happened? How did the oil fall out of the kandili? And then he told me, how he just wanted to kiss his favorite icon, and it fell down. After talking about how the situation happened, I explained to him that he would be helping me to clean up the mess. We moved the icon table and cleaned up the oil. We set it back up, and to this day, he still remembers the time he knocked over the kandili and how he was very careful now to kiss icons that are hanging on the wall. For about two years now, we have this quote on our fridge from Dr. Mamalakis' book that says, Responding requires us to be intentional, patient, kind, gentle, self-controlled, long-suffering, meek, faithful, wise, and loving when our child misbehaves. Responding is the way we model all the virtues we want our children to learn. Responding to our children is the way we venerate them as icons of Christ and requires a certain amount of trust that God is working in our children through the struggles over time. When I grew up, I knew that I wanted to help my children be patient, kind, gentle, and self-disciplined, and that my husband and I needed to be examples for our children. If we want our children to respond to a situation instead of react, we have to show them how to achieve that. Every decision that we make as parents should be born out of an orthodox mindset. Much of my son's life is about making choices. Black pants or blue pants? Spaghetti or sandwich? Praying with toys? Or reading books? But with every choice I give him, I make sure that he makes a decision. For example, when I tell him to pick up his toys, I remind him that it's not a question. He has a choice. Pick up his toys or he will not get a story before bed. By giving consequences for not following directions, I am setting limits for him. Not making a choice is not an option in our house, which he now reminds me.
Making limits does not stop my son from misbehaving, but it does help him with his life. Our lives in our society are formed around limits and consequences. Now it happens quite often that my son does not respond to the choices or directions that I give him. So what do I do? I wait for him to respond. I give him time to think about what he wants to do. And after a while, I make sure to let him know that I understand that it is hard and it's a struggle. I say, I know it's really hard to put your toys away sometimes. And then I remind him of the consequences. If you don't put your toys away, you will not be able to get a story before bed. Most of the time he tells me how he is feeling. Other times, he ends up with the consequences and he usually cries, which is pretty hard for me. As a mother, I hate when my children cry or are feeling hurt, but it's normal. If I try and make everything perfect for him, it's not a realistic picture of life. It's good for him to feel independent and to have difficulties, but I will be there to support him and to remind him that his mom and his dad are there to help him, and Christ will always be there no matter what. Sometimes my son's behavior ends up in a timeout. This is the most common punishment we use in our household. Moses has a spot that he goes to without toys or games or books where he sits and stands for a set amount of time. A good rule is the child can handle as many minutes in time out as they are old. I like to think of a timeout like soccer or football. When a team takes a timeout, it is not a punishment because they did something bad. They take a timeout because they want to think about what they will do. They like to talk about the problems they have and how to succeed. The same is true for having a time out at home. I like to make sure to remind my son to think about his actions and how he can improve them or make them better. If he's made a big mistake, I like to remind him to make sure to ask for forgiveness and say sorry to the person that he hurt. Most of the time after a time out, my son likes to talk. He always remembers his mistakes from days before and he refers to them. He says how he made a mistake and how he felt and what happened and I like to listen to him when he speaks about this. It doesn't mean that I am letting him win. It means I am respecting him as an image of Christ. I respond to his words, and I make sure that he knows that we all make mistakes and that we all sin. It's a part of our life, but we can always ask for forgiveness and make ourselves better in the future. I would like to end with this prayer by St. Porphyrios. Let us keep this prayer in our hearts, on our minds, and on our lips every day as we guide our children on their path of life. We say, Lord Jesus Christ, give our light to our children. We entrust them to you. You gave them to us, but we are weak and unable to guide them, so please illuminate them. We love our children, and therefore we want to bring them to Christ, as our Lord truly is in all of his glory. To give them less is to give them a stone in the place of bread. The true aim of our Christian life consists of acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. As for fasts and vigils, prayers, almsgiving, and every good deed done for Christ's sake, these are only the means of acquiring the Holy Spirit of God, St. Seraphim of Sarov says. As parents, we want to acquire the Holy Spirit and raise our children to walk in the Spirit and have Christ as the center of their minds, hearts, and bodies. You have listened to The Homemaking Missionary on Radio Njalia.